Okay, everybody, it's time to talk about decisions when going to bottle. What are the things that are important to look at from a wine chemistry and safety perspective during uh, the bottling process? And note this picture here is the nitrogen dropper on the white bottling line. And this is the way we got rid of that dissolved oxygen issue um, in the, uh, the white wines that we have in that screw cap ullage space. That really helps us keep our SO2 usage to a minimum. So knocking back to the previous lecture, I think this is kind of uh, a nifty picture to look at. So let's talk about critical control points pre-bottling. These are the things that you have to have ready to go before you bottle. And I'm going to talk about these things in terms of the whites we just did. Um, but whatever the case may be, all the wines must be of uniform filterability. So what you don't want to do is run 10 wines and seven of them are, you know, coarse filtered and, you know, uh, three of them are sterile filtered. You know, you're just going to clog it up membranes. So they all have to be at the same filter level. That's nice. You've got cross flows. Just get that one past a single uh, step stability. Uh, the wines have to be cold stable. Um, you know, you can chill proof them. Uh, we can talk about KCP a little bit, potassium concentration product. So ETS runs really easy. Uh, you get a really quick uh, return on, on how fast that works. Um, it's something that we started doing this year, and I'm going to make sure I kind of include that in some of our talks as we go forward. Um, but one thing we also like to do is uh, carboxymethyl cellulose. Just put a little bit in there. It's a, a, a tartrate crystal inhibitor, and it just keeps the wine from, from throwing hazes. It's really nice. Uh, it also adds a nice little bit of mouthfeel, too. Um, and it's super cheap. It cost us $20 to do uh, our entire uh, lot for the school. So then protein stability, um, uh, we also have to make sure we're there. You know, we've gone over protein stability, but if those wines aren't protein stable, they're going to throw a haze in bottle. And protein, you know, I think people can be forgiving of wine crystals, but protein hazes just look gross. So um, just make sure that they're uh, protein stable. Um, and then our dissolved oxygen is nice and low, shooting for less than 0.5 milligrams a liter. Um, that our molecular SO2 is about 0.8 milligrams a liter for dry whites or our molecular SO2 is uh, 1 to 1 1.5 wine, wines with RS. Um, the reality is, is uh, we have to overshoot on our Riesling a little bit and just account for the fact that it's going to drop. So usually with our Riesling, even though the molecular is probably 1.5 when we go to bottle, because um, we're going to bottle with like 25 parts free um, at a pH of you know 3.0 you know, or 3.1, um, within a, a few months that's going to drop. So our Rieslings, we tend to hold back for a little bit before we release them, we don't release them right away so that SO2 can, can step into the background. Um, and then on, on red wines, um, you know, 0.5 milligrams per liter molecular or 40 milligrams free reds might be a little high, probably say 30 is a little closer, but whichever is less. You can't get to uh, some reasonable molecular level at point, you know, these 3, 8, 3, 9, 4, 0 reds that you make, you just can't. Um, and so uh, you just don't even really worry about molecular, you just really kind of worry about uh, making sure you've got some free SO2 as an antioxidant. But the nice thing is if you filter, you don't have to worry about things blooming in your bottle. Other things we have to talk about, critical control points outside of chemistry, is uh, we have to know that the temperature of the tank versus the bottle. Um, your wine going into bottle has to be really similar to that of the inside of the bottling truck. You can't bottle cold wine. Uh, well, you can bottle cold wine, but you can't bottle cold wine and label cold wine. Uh, you think back to when we bottled the muscat, you guys were all freezing your hands off because we were bottling it really cold to hold the CO2 in solution, but those bottles will start sweating right away. And as soon as those bottles start sweating, uh, you can't get a label on them. So if you're going to bottle on a truck or you're going to bottle on a line where you are labeling at the same time, uh, which is really nice for those of you that had the joy of uh, hand labeling, it takes a lot of time uh, to do it one bottle at a time. Um, so uh, it's really nice to be able to get that all done at once. So when you bottle, make sure that your, your wine is, is close to that temperature of the truck. So if you're, you know, something like 60 degrees Fahrenheit in the cellar, uh, similar uh, temperature inside of the truck. Um, then the other things we need to check on is dissolved oxygen, uh, free sulfur dioxide, uh, then volume, pH, and then we also have a cork vacuum uh, that we want to show. So uh, when we're running on the truck, uh, there's a little needle we pierce through the cork to show that the cork's being pulled under vacuum. Because if you just shove a cork in a bottle, you put it under pressure. And um, when you put that cork under pressure, uh, if those bottles get inverted any time 
afterwards, um, the, the corks themselves will get soaked up and you'll end up with a really, really bad situation with those wines getting laid down by a client. Um, interestingly enough, even on cork wines, cork manufacturers recommend that you don't invert bottles, that you leave them upright. Um, that's uh, pretty standard across the, the cork industry. There's enough humidity on the uh, wine itself that you're supposed to actually keep the corks upright. Uh, you're, you're not supposed to invert them uh, later on. I thought that was really interesting uh, from multiple cork manufacturers. I've heard that. And then screw caps, we have to talk about screw cap torques. Um, and I'm hoping I can show you that. Uh, and the, you have to see how tight the screw cap is when it breaks. So um, hopefully we can uh, get to that and I'll show you that in person. But these are things you have to be checking on. Okay, so we want to be unfiltered. Um, a lot of people are into that and a lot of people do it. So here's the thought process is you have to be malic dry. You've got to know that. You've got to have a confirmatory number. You've got to be sugar dry. You've got to know it. You've got to know your uh, scorpion levels. Uh, alcohol by volume 15 plus is really helpful. It's not necessary, but boy, is it helpful. Because once you're over 15% alcohol, nothing grows. Uh, the uh, differences in scorpion panels between a under 13 and over, or like an under 15 and over 15, they just are so different. Uh, things just don't like to grow in high alcohol wines. Um, whereas lower alcohol wines with high pH, like our Carmier, or um, make the Stony Vine Syrah, uh, those wines are terrifying uh, because all sorts of stuff will grow in those and the scorpions on them are mortifying when you look at them. Um, and then the other thing is, is uh, we're talking about zero distribution. Um, you know, we're putting these out in distribution, you just really big risk that you're sending your wines out that could blow up on people. Um, there's gonna be some stuff, and I thought this was fun. I left this slide in here. Uh, this was from years ago. But I was like, if, and then parentheses, when we get Brett this unfiltered thing that we do at the school might end, and sure as heck, uh, two years later uh, was the year we had a Brett outbreak. And uh, we fortunately knocked it on the head and it hasn't shown up again since, which is really remarkable. Um, so uh, pretty excited about that. But um, uh, it was just one of those things that I was really surprised about. But we'll, we'll, we'll solve a Brett problem. That'll be a whole talk. All right, so I'm gonna show you two thought processes and two wines that we're making decisions on. So uh, take a look at both of these uh, wines. You know, we're going to bottle both with about the same free SO2. Um, the molecular is non-existent. Um, total sulfurs are just fine. They're nice and low, especially on that Petit Verdot. Um, but our pHs are both really high, pH 4 and pH 3.8. VAs are good and clean, but the big key difference here is uh, uh, our, our GSM is coming in and I said 13.9%, it's actually 14%, uh, but uh, uh, alcohol, this is a big difference because the Petit Verdot is tasting room only, it's a hand cell uh, and it's not going to a distributor. Whereas the 13 GSM, we made a lot of it and we actually, we sold a lot of it to custom clients. So we sold a, a lot of it custom labeled to people and so it went out far and wide. And both of these wines, incidentally, were huge award winners, um, regardless of the fact that one was unfiltered and one was filtered. So let's talk about this and, and why. So we take a look at the microbiology on the GSM, and it's pretty stunning uh, when you look at it. Um, and especially we look at uh, some of the Pediococcus numbers and things like that. There's just a whole lot of stuff growing in it. Whereas the, uh, the 14 Petit Verdot, um, which is just another, we just ran another scorpion on it. I don't know why they did it on a sluggish panel, but um, we look at it and it has very little anything in it. It's just super clean. Um, and that's just that really the big difference here is that chemistry wise, they're both high pH wines, but that one point in alcohol, um, 1.5 point in alcohol, huge difference. So, you know, we bring the crossflow to the game uh, for the GSM. And the Petit Verdot, we just said, you know, we'll just run it through a bug catcher and call it good. And we never had issues with either of them, um, but definitely wanted to get that uh, a GSM uh, sterile filtered. So um, this one I thought was interesting. Um, and we uh, goofed up on our crossflow. I've since discovered what was wrong, but we ran it through the crossflow. Um, and before that, we ran it through the crossflow. Uh, we had, these are the numbers, and then after the cross flow, we still had quite a bit of acetic acid bacteria. Um, it was, this was, now in hindsight, was due to a valve that was open. It wasn't supposed to be open. But um, 
you know, we still run this line through a membrane. It didn't clog the membrane. But the fact of the matter is, is that even when you sterile filter a wine, it isn't sterile. Um, uh, we've we've seen cross flow numbers where we have some stuff on the other side. That that's just that idea of nominal uh, sterility is really a thing. Is that you you're only even if you're going to run it through a quote unquote sterile filter, it's not sterile until uh, it goes through that membrane. I want to kind of switch into a different thought. Uh, white wines. Uh, can you do unfiltered whites? Yeah, it can be done. Absolutely. Um, if you're going to bottle the wine in under a year, you probably want to still add some bentonite. If you ease age a wine out for a year, 18 months, and you can keep it uh, from oxidizing in barrel, um, you know, keep your sulfurs up, keep it watched, keep it top, keep it tight, um, you can uh, actually get away from, from using bentonite. Uh, all those protein instability issues will sort of work themselves out over the course of a year. Again, this isn't something I would recommend for large distribution, but for small uh, hand cell white wines, this is a totally doable thing. And uh, another thing is really preferable is long lease aging. Um, long lease aging re releases a lot of banana proteins into the wine. They give the wine mouthfeel and they also give it uh, colloid uh, protective uh, qualities. So it will keep the wine from throwing hazes, uh, both tartrate and um, uh, protein. So interesting, uh, interesting stuff. So long lease aging is really preferred. And if you can do this for a year to you know 15 months on a white wine, uh, you can get it pretty clear. You're going to have to rack it, but racking really tight, again, on that oxygen pickup. Whites don't accept oxygen at all. So when you're racking, making sure that you've got it under cover of inert gas. Um, but if you, uh, you know, can do that uh, successfully, you can get pretty good clarity off of two or three rackings um, on a white. It'll uh, really help those, that dissolved CO2 go away and help those, uh, those wines settle. What's interesting about unfiltered white, it's actually easier. So in, remember we talked back at sulfur dioxide, red wines, the total SO2 eventually drops out. It disappears, it goes away. Um, and because of that, that's why red wines have to go through mallow or have to be filtered um, because it's gonna bind to tannins and fall out. Whites don't do that. Total SO2 will stick around pretty much for eternity. Um, and so if you get your total SO2 up around 100 milligrams a liter of total, not even free, but just talking about total, and if you're gonna, barrel age of wine for a year, I'm going to assure you your sulfur, and keep your sulfur dioxide straight, I'm going to assure you your total sulfur is going to be over 100. It's probably closer to 200. Um, and uh, your chance of a spontaneous ML is non-existent. Um, so as long as that wine is sugar dry, and you don't have to be malic dry, uh, you can go to bottle with it, which is pretty crazy. Um, again, not something I would recommend for distribution, but for a small uh, boutique wine, my wine raid, this is something that's totally doable. So I kind of want to take you through our uh, Muscat Ottenel, which is the opposite. This is the polar opposite of something that you would do unfiltered. You have to do this. Um, and this is, you know, you guys know as well as I do that we have won so many uh, awards. But I thought this was really fun going back to 2015 that we had uh, an article written on September 12th uh, about bottling our Muscat. Uh, that was just how hot that year was. But it was before school started. So... Uh, you guys know me talk about this really, really well, but this is a wine that you absolutely, in every way, shape, and form, have to, uh, you know, have to sterile bottle. You know, you're going to be coming in with low alcohol, and you're going to be coming in with lots of sugar. And so this is a wine that you really have to have all of your critical controls in place. Uh, very much the polar opposite from bottling our four to five wine. So I just kind of give you guys this. This is the this is the recipe. You got it. You keep it. You know, basically we we you know go right go right at it with SO2 at the crusher. We press it reductively, maybe a little bit of skin contact because there's going to be so much sugar. It's going to cover up uh, any phenolics we might be, you know get. Um, we would add pectinase for settling. In this case, we uh, this last year we did flotation. I'll talk a little bit more about flotation. We get to oxygen and nitrogen. Then we had a little bentonite and. Um, then we do a, a split where we split it into juice and wine. And then we add about 300 milligrams a liter of potassium sorbate and 200 milligrams a liter of SO2 to the, uh, to the wine. So what's interesting about that is, is I'll actually dial that in based on the volume of juice that I think I'm gonna need to add back. So now I add enough SO2 to the juice reserve and it's just a simple calculation. And it was a little closer to 350 parts SO2 this year. Uh, and, and what we do is the, the, the wine that ferments, we never add SO2 to, 
Um, as soon as it's done fermenting, we cross flow it and then we add the juice reserve and that's our sulfur dioxide. Um, <clears throat> and then you get both your uh, potassium sorbate, which is uh, yeast aside, which stops uh, sugar from uh, being yeast being, being able to ferment and you add your uh, SO2 at the same time. Um, and then uh, we rack to a fermentation tank, uh, uh, you know, when it's just the, the, the stuff we're going to ferment, obviously the juice reserve goes in another room. And then uh, we take it with QA23. Usually ferment, I try to target 17 to 20 days. Uh, and sometimes we've even just said, you know, it's not quite dry and whatever. The only reason why we take it to dryness is just that simple bit of settling. Once it goes to dry, all the yeast fall out. And so it's just so much easier. Trying to stop a ferment is really hard uh, without the right equipment. And what I mean by the right equipment is, is say you wanted to just make this wine without using juice reserve. Um, the, you'd have to chill, you'd have to chill the wine. So you get it really cold. You have to have a good chiller. So you've got to get the wine down to, you know, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Fahrenheit or under. And then you add a bunch of sulfur, uh, usually a hundred or so parts, uh, because the yeast are still kind of active and they'll absorb it and bind a lot of it up. And then, uh, then you have to rack it and get it off the lees or, um, what the bigger wineries do is they all have centrifuges and they, they go ahead and centrifuge the wine right at that point in time to get the bulk of the yeast out. That way they don't have to use as much refrigeration to knock the wine down. Well, we don't have uh, really, really good refrigeration. It's okay, but it's not that good. And we don't have um, uh, a centrifuge. We've got a cross flow, which is okay, but we totally clog it if we tried to run light wine. So if we can get that wine to at least finish fermentation and then uh, you know, get it racked once, we'll get so much more settling that the cross flow can chew through it really easy. If you're using a plate and frame or something like that, you're definitely going to have to get a little bit of clarity beforehand. And this just saves you that, that step. The other thing that's nice about juice reserves is that they, um, uh, uh, allow you to dial in the sweetness perfectly. You can come back in and, and do your trials to bring sugar back. And that's just really nice. So here's our production notes. You guys know this, you've seen it, you walked it. Um, and then basically we go ahead and add some CMC for cold stability. That's the way we get there uh, with the muscat because we just don't have time to turn it around. And then we sterile bottle it on a hand spout bottling line, which is mortifying. And then uh, sales begin and we make that wine on margin, you know, and that's what allows us to buy barrels every year. But I'm gonna go into hand bottling in its own lecture, but just think about this for a brief moment. You know, here we are bottling uh, an 8.5%, 9% alcohol wine with somewhere around 5% residual sugar. Now, let me put that in context for you. When we bottle sparkling wine, which is like making a bomb, we bottle that with about 25 grams of sugar. And 25 grams of sugar will build 100 PSI in a bottle if we have a referment. In the Muscat, if we were to have that referment, we would build 200 plus PSI. Um, and in that case, the bottles actually can explode. And that's really terrifying uh, that you're sending out a potential bomb to your customer if you aren't really mining your P's and Q's. So I'm going to talk about a whole lecture on how we prep the bottling line just to be able to do this. Um, but we are doing a whole lot of cleaning beforehand. There's a whole lot of steaming that goes on. Um, and the other thing that we're doing too, just to be safe, is we're adding a little bit of potassium sorbate and uh, plenty of sulfur to make sure those wines don't, don't re-ferment. So wine chemistry sort of review, how much risk are you willing to assume? You know, how big is your production? Where is it going to go? I mean, if you're making, if you're Chateau St. Michel making uh, a million cases or millions of cases of Riesling that are going all over the world, uh, I promise you they are sterile filtering. I promise you they are doing lots of bottle QC where they're taking the bottles and they're, they're sending them out and plating them and checking them to make sure that there's no um, uh, microbes in them. And so if that wine's being distributed, you know, you've really got to take that next level of, of, of bottling QC. Now, if you're bottling, like I said, 15% alcohol, you know, Petit Verdot from Walla Walla that's going to be sold into Walla Walla, only your wine club. Yeah, just put it in a bottle. I mean, you know, do you, or even let's take this a step further. It's like our, our tiny port. We don't even have to wash the bottling line. You know, we do just because we don't want any bugs in it. But you know, realistically, the tiny port's been sitting outside for 10 years. Anything that's going to happen to it has happened to it. Just get it in the bottle. However you get it in the bottle is fine. I mean, just siphoning a bottle is totally fine. Um, uh, once you get that alcohol up to 18%, you know, it really changes the way that you uh, approach the bottle. 
uh, bottling. So uh, it's uh, it's really just a, you know, it's like bottling spirits must be really easy because you don't have to worry about any of this at all. Um, so uh, interesting stuff. Um, and uh, anyway, if you do want to bottle and filter, just got to know what's got to know what's living in the wine. Filtration is an extra step, but it almost guarantees safety. And that's the nice thing about filtering. It just lets you sleep at night and you know those wines aren't going to have an issue later on. Uh, that's really what it comes down to. Um, and they go hand in hand. All right. Next on to bottling checks or uh, hand bottling.